So welcome back to the class on computational neuroscience. We now return to the question of memory models and the specific model that we are going to look at is the Hopfield model. And to do that, we build on what we saw in the previous three sections. So we said that you, in order to store a specific pattern, just one pattern, you would like to connect a black pixel that has a connection to another black pixel. You would like to connect this with a plus one weight, a white pixel with a white pixel with a plus one weight, and a black pixel with a white pixel with a minus one weight. These are the three rules put up here. Now, what is a prototype pattern? A prototype pattern has for each location, i, it has a certain pixel value. And let me now introduce the notation that I say if the pixel is black, then at location i, I have a variable p i, which has a value of plus one. If the pixel is white, then at location i, I have a value of minus one. Now something interesting happens. We have had here three different rules, but with this notation, I can actually write it as pi times pj. So let's just check this. If I have a connection from black to black, it's plus one times plus one. I have a positive weight. I'm done. If it's a connection white to white, it's minus one times minus one. I'm done. If it's a connection from white to black, it's minus one times one, and the weight is negative. So instead of having three different separate rules, I just now have one compact formula. And compared to what we had before, nothing really has changed. So this is the case for one pattern. But now the question is, what happens if we have several patterns? In fact, a memory that always goes to the same memory content is not a useful memory. I want to show a noisy input and I want to find the closest prototype. I don't want to find always the same prototype. So I can talk about a memory model only if I have several prototypes. And here, prototype P1 could be a T, P2 could be a A. And now the proposition is that I just said for the prototype number one, the rule would be pi times pj for prototype number one. And the number of the prototype is now this upper index. Now, if I have a second prototype, let me just add the weight to the old one. And I say plus pi2 pj2. And if I have five prototypes, I would run here over all possible prototypes, say m prototypes, m equal 5 if I have 5 prototypes. So this is now my rule for storing the weights. So this is now my rule for storing different patterns, different prototypes. This is how I set my weights. The dynamics remains the same as before. Well, I told you at, at the beginning that we are not really interested in these two-dimensional layout of the patterns, but we, we should think of just a vector just a prototype vector. Moreover, there is no reason to think that in the brain, if these different locations, i and j, correspond to different neurons, that they would encode a real photographic image of what comes in. There's a lot of processing steps between the input and the location where the memory is actually stored. Therefore, instead of thinking of these two-dimensional arrangements, we should rather think just of a pattern as a random combination. Somewhere in the brain, some neurons are on, somewhere in the brain, some neurons are off, and this combination of on and off corresponds to a certain pattern, to a certain prototype. Okay, and now this leads to the Hopfield model. I can store several random patterns. The probability that I have a black pixel is 50%, probably 0.5. I have a fully connected network, which means each Pixel connects to all other pixels, even if they are far away. And I have this rule for storing the weights, the rule number one. And I have a dynamics. I have to distinguish between 
the patterns I would like to store, that's in the weights. These prototypes patterns have the index P, and I have to distinguish this from the momentary state, which is the state variable SI, and it only can take two values, plus one or minus one. So I have binary neurons. So in this notation, P is also binary. Black pixel is plus one, white pixel is minus one, and the state variables also have these two, uh, two states, plus one or minus one. So I told you at the beginning of the lecture, when you talked about the algorithmic approaches, finding the closest prototype, that you need to compare the current state with the target patterns, with the prototype. So say the current state is a certain combination. This is my current state. I have a black pixel followed by a white pixel, followed by a white pixel, followed by a black pixel, white pixel, black pixel, black pixel, white pixel. That's my current state. And then I have a prototype pattern, and the prototype also has black and white pixels, and it might be a slightly different configuration. So in the algorithmic approach, we said we need to measure similarity. Well, what similarity? These pixels are the same. These pixels are not the same. These pixels are the same, 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 not the same, not the same. So in this case, I have a certain number of pixels where the current state is already identical to the target pattern and other pixels where this is not the case. One way to measure this similarity is to look at the overlap. So I need to compare the current state, for example, at location i, si, with the target pattern at the same location pi. But I have several of these target patterns, so I've given you the index. Then I can say the similarity between SI and PI, PI mu times SI, well, if they are the same, minus one and minus one, I have a similarity of plus one, if I multiply. If they are not the same, then I would get a minus one. So summing over all these different locations I would give me the similarity between my current state, SI, at time t and pattern number mu. And this similarity measure is called the overlap. So the overlap at time t is just the sum over all these multiplications, these little comparisons. And for normalization reasons, we normalize with 1 over n, where n is the number of neurons or the number of pixels. OK. So now let's use what we have learned and let's try to understand the dynamics of the Hopfield model. So this was our rule for the dynamics. And here I have the weights. So let's look at these. What are the weights? Well, the weights are given here. So I plug this in. PI mu, PJ mu, sum over mu. That's the weights. And then I have my current state, sj of t. And I copy the sum sign, and I copy the sign. But now something interesting happens. Look at this sum over j, pj, sj. Well, that's exactly what we had here, except for the factor n. Therefore, I can write this as n times m mu of t. It's the overlap at time t. And for the rest, I can copy what I had before. So I copy sum over mu pi mu. Now let's look at this. We started off with an equation which just said, well, I have interacting neurons. Now it turns out that with the weights that we have put in, these neurons actually calculate an overlap measure, which is the similarity between the current state at one of, and one of the stored patterns, mu. And in fact, I sum over mu, so the similarity with all the different stored patterns is taken into account. So as a first step, we see that 
just interacting neurons, no central controller, allows to implement the calculation of a similarity measure. And then, as we'll see in a minute, it will pull out the closest prototype. But before we do this, so let's just wrap up as an intermediate conclusion. I have stored in a network of interacting neurons different prototypes. The prototypes are random patterns. And I've stored several of these. And implicitly, these interacting neurons calculate similarity and find the closest prototype because the dynamics implicitly implements the overlap MU. And the whole thing runs without explicit control unit, without explicit memory unit. The memory is in the connections. Before we continue, let me just extend this a little bit. Previously, I said we can compare the current state with one of the prototype patterns. But of course, we can in the same way also compare the target pattern or prototype pattern number three with the prototype pattern number seven. And we can if look at the similarity of two patterns and say, I just take pattern number three, P3, at location I, and then I sum over different locations and compare that with the prototype seven with a pattern, the pixel at location I of pattern number seven. And then I sum over I, and I take a one over N, and this is completely analogous to the similarity me measure that we had for the overlap. It's now similarity between two patterns or correlation between two patterns. So this is now the correlation between pattern number three and pattern number seven. Now something interesting happens. This, I said, is just the pixel number i or location i or vector index i for the pattern number three. So I can also write this just as a scalar product, the whole pattern three, the whole pattern seven, and one of them should be transposed. I don't have the space to write this down. So it's just a scalar product between two vectors. Now there are special cases where the scalar product is orthogonal, and that means that C between a pattern mu and a mat pattern u, the correlation is one only if mu equal nu and is zero otherwise. So orthogonal patterns have the name orthogonal because of this scalar product between two vectors, and it just means if you sum up all this and you get up, you get down zero. Now something very interesting happens for random patterns. So let's just try to write down a random sequence of plus and minus ones. I tried it here. Okay, you have a couple of pluses and minus. And then you close your eyes and write down a second of these sequences, and that's what I did here. Now, since both are random, there are just as many plus plus as minus plus. So there are as many matching conditions, plus plus or minus minus, than there are non-match conditions. And therefore, random patterns are nearly orthogonal. They are nearly orthogonal because there's no guarantee that if I add this up over a finite number of patterns, it would exactly add up to zero. But random patterns are nearly orthogonal, and this is useful, as we'll see later, for the analysis of the Hopfield model. So before we continue, let's now look at exercise number two. Let's assume you have four orthogonal patterns. I explained what this is. And assume that at time t equals zero, there's only overlap with pattern number three, but no overlap with other patterns. And I want you to calculate the overlap with pattern number three in the next time step, using the formalism I just explained. 